Thank you for coming to, uh, to the NGO Policy and International Relations panel. I assume if you're here, you're, you're interested in something that we are, which is you're basically it's something in you that you're, you're predicated to helping others. You have a notion of service to your community or a nation, uh, advancing causes, advocacy, shaping policy, and making the world a better place and a better functioning place. Um, we're all happy with the career path and here to answer any questions you have. I knew I wanted to do something with the government. I knew I wanted to do something overseas. I wanted. I liked learning about other cultures. Um, when I was in high school, I studied abroad. Um, my junior year of high school, um, as I told my table, it was basically because I just wanted to get out of my high school. <laughs> um, and then I studied abroad um, my first quarter of my second year uh, at the university. I studied in Germany. So I knew I was excited about that. Um, it was actually my, I was taking the what did we determine it was, acting fundamentals course uh, for the Hume requirement my first year of, of college. And uh, we broke up. We were doing scenes of the crucible. And we broke up into little partners. And my director was just asking us kind of what we were interested in. And I said, exactly that. I want to do something with the government, something international, but I don't really know what. And he said, oh my god, one of my best friends has this fellowship that is amazing. And you need to look it up. And I did. And so for anyone who's interested in the Foreign Service, take out your pens right now. Um, <laughs> the, I looked up the Thomas R. Pickering Fellowship, P-I-C-K-E-R-I-N-G. Um, there's also the Wrangell, R-A-N-G-E-L Fellowship. <clears throat> Excuse me. They're very similar. So I went home to Max Pilevsky, got on my computer, looked it up, and said, oh my god, this is what I need to do. I need to do this. Um, so at the time, you applied for the undergraduate fellowship your second year of college. Um, they've now changed it. So the undergraduate fellowship, you apply for it your third year. Um, there's also a graduate fellowship. So I'll just tell you a little bit about them real quick. Um, the undergraduate fellowship uh, is a longer commitment to the State Department, um, but they pay for some of your college. So they pay currently they pay for one year of college for you, and that's housing, everything, books. They pay for everything. And then you have a, a series of internships during the summer. And then you go to graduate school. You are required to go to graduate school, and they pay for your graduate school. Um, and when you're finished, you're required to join the Foreign Service. So this was a great deal for me. As I said, there's also a graduate fellowship, with, which is a slightly less commitment. And you apply for that as you're applying for graduate school. So you can take time off in between college and graduate school. Um, but so that was something that was really, you know, really interesting for me. So I worked really hard on that application my second year. And I got an interview. And I, they flew me to Washington, DC. And I got the fellowship. Um, the other thing is the, the Pickering, fellow, Pickering and Wrangell are both um, termed diversity fellowships. I will tell you, in my cohort of 20 students, there's like four white guys. Um, so it, it's just looking for people who are not necessarily um, going to join the Foreign Service otherwise. That has to do with socioeconomic background, has to do with um, regional background. There aren't many people from the Midwest who generally join the Foreign Service. So don't be discouraged if you look on the website and it says diversity, or, or be encouraged when you look on the website and it says that it's a diversity fellowship. Um, so long story short, I've known that I was going to join the Foreign Service since my second year of college. <laughs> um, but. I will be happy to talk about, after other questions, about how to join the Foreign Service without that fellowship. Um, yeah. So <laughs> Did I answer the question? Um, I, I actually grew up in California. I did not go to the college. I went to UC Santa Cruz. Um, finished. I, went, I spent 14 months abroad during my junior year. It was fantastic uh, living, living overseas. I was in Jerusalem and had a wonderful experience came back, finished school, uh, which if you know UC Santa Cruz and finishing in four years is really something. And um, then just knew I wanted to go back overseas. So I moved back overseas on my own, uh, lived uh, over there for another four years, and applied to the University of Chicago for graduate school when um, from over there, took my GREs from you know, sitting in the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, and did it over there, you know, filed all my applications from over there. and. Um, and did that. Um, so I basically, from when I left, had about two weeks to jam back to California, kind of 
settle affairs and then come out to Chicago where I'd really had never ever, for all intents and purposes, ever been. Um, so arrived and lived in International House my first year and then over on Kimbark and 56th my second year and uh, loved it. It was my first exposure to Chicago. So my, my two year stay in Chicago for grad school is actually now on its 22nd <laughs> year um, because you never know where you go to grad school has a pretty big effect on when you end up staying. Um, but you know, thankfully, it's, this is a great city. I met my wife, you know, have kids, the whole thing. So we love it here. But um, as far as the career path, I, I started out after Harris School in affordable housing. Um, started out the Chicago Housing Authority of all things, and then went on to get more and more involved in just the syndication of housing tax credits and all kinds of the financial aspects. Worked for a capital markets company for a long time. Uh, got very into the, the capital markets piece of it, and then kind of woke up one morning and said. I don't want to buy debt for 20 more years and, you know, and make mortgage securities and do all that kind of stuff. This can't be what it's about. I like living overseas. I like the international thing. I somehow got off path. And um, I basically, you know, told my wife I'd just really want to go, go back to graduate school again for the second time and get an MBA. And that's what I did. Uh, Booth was a consideration. It wasn't called Booth then, but Booth was a consideration. But it was a little far, and uh, Northwestern is literally about four blocks from my house. So <laughs> I went to business school there, uh, got an MBA in 2006, and immediately went to work for AJC. Uh, the reason AJC is a perfect fit for me is because I actually wasn't even really thinking about a Jewish nonprofit that had nothing to do with it. It was more about the size of the nonprofit, 250 people, a $42 million annual budget based in New York, big office in Washington, nine offices overseas. You know, in, we got offices in Paris, Brussels, Berlin, Rome, Jerusalem, Mumbai, um, uh, a Southeast Asian office as well, and um, stationed in Singapore, and in Sao Paulo, Brazil. So it kind of like, as you said, there aren't a lot of international opportunities based you know, where I can actually live in Chicago, and I found the one. So it, it's, it's terrific in that way. You can really you know, get, you know, scratch your international itch also, and then also stay here. Um, to be fair, I'm a New York-based employee, though. So I mean, I'm sure my, my executive director would rather I live in New York. Um, my team in Washington would rather I live in Washington, maybe. Um, but I can't, I'm not. I'm, we're not moving. <laughs> so, um, you know, th this is a great city. So that, that's a little bit about how I got to, to do this. And actually what, what's been most interesting and what I think I bring to the table a little bit at AJC is uh, the nonprofit world, the foreign policy world, everything is filled with a lot of really, really smart people who are interested in the largest foreign policy issues of the day. I actually am interested in them, but that's not my job. I actually run the nonprofit. Everything from setting strategy to budgeting to resource allocation to human resources, it, 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 it marries the perfectly the blend of uh, my business background uh, from having run a, a, an affordable housing operation in the Midwest to bringing sort of business strategy to the nonprofit and uh, foreign policy world. So that's, what, that's my story. Uh, second question, I, this, is, this is, and I think we've touched on this, but I'm going to start here this time. Uh, you said some of this. What are the best paths for students seeking to, seeking to enter your field? The best path, of course, is the one I took because you should all apply for the Pickering Fellowship. Um, no, there are lots of paths to the Foreign Service. Um, the most traditional path is a test. Um, it's the Foreign Service test, so the FSOT, they call it. Um, this is a test. It's completely free. Um, there are no requirements except you have to be 21, I believe, because you have to be 21 to have the job because you drink at parties. Um, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> um, there might be other reasons why you have to be 21, but that's the one I can think of. Um, <laughs> And it's, it, like I said, it's completely free. There are no requirements in terms of background or degree. I think you have to have a, a high school degree, but you don't have to have a college degree or a master's or anything. Um, actually, if any of you are 21, I believe the next one is in February. Um, so if you go to careers.state.gov, they will talk about all of the, um, the preparations for the exam. So there are five career paths in the State Department Foreign Service. I'm going to put some parentheses on this and just say there are other Foreign Service officers who do not work for the State Department. 
Foreign Commercial Service has a, a foreign service. Um, USAID has a foreign service. Um, CDC has a foreign service. They're just not as big as the State Department Foreign Service. So most of the time when you say, say FSO or Foreign Service Officer, they mean state. But it's not the only way to get there. But, um, but I'm speaking about the Foreign Service test for the State Department. Um, so there are five career tracks. Um, there's political, which is kind of the traditional diplomat that we think of. Um, they're a bit like a reporter. They're on the ground in a country, and they're supposed to sort of be keeping track of what's going on. And they have a lot of meetings with people, and they report back to Washington, and they're kind of keeping an eye on things and, uh, and managing the, the diplomatic relationship. There's economic officers who are doing very similar things, but focused on economics and business. Um, management officers run the post overseas. They find our housing, they make sure that HR is working, they make sure our facilities and buildings are safe, um, so they're the management. Um, consular officers, they, um, do, they do two things. They help, um, excuse me, <clears throat> they help in, uh, foreigners come to the United States. Some countries, you need a non-immigrant visa to come to the United States, no matter what. Um, but some countries, we have agreements with them, and they can come to the United States, just like we can go to certain countries in Europe without getting a visa for an extended period of time. Um, and then all countries, you need, a non, or you need an immigrant visa if you're planning to come to the United States and become a citizen. So if you were to marry a foreigner or um, if you have siblings or parents overseas. So consular officers do that, and they also help American citizens overseas. So if you're in another country, if you're planning any travel in the near future, you should register your travel on the State Department. <laughs> you can go to the State Department website and say where you're going, and they'll actually put your information into that post uh, database. So if there were an emergency, they would contact you. So when we're um, evacuating American citizens abroad, that's, that's helpful. Um, but if you were to need a passport reissued, or if you had an emergency, you would go to that post. Um, so that's consular officers, but every Foreign Service officer has to do a consular tour, so at least one year of doing that type of work, and that's just because there's a lot of it, um, and so uh, everyone in your first two tours has to do some sort of consular work. That's why I did immigrant visas, but it was really fun and I loved it. Um, and then the last one is public diplomacy, the last career track, um, and that's the career track that I'm in. Um, public diplomacy is kind of like the marketing for the United States, right? It's, it's communicating with the public and, and sending out our messages of what the United States is about. And it's also um, doing, like I said, cultural and education exchange programs. So things like Fulbright that I'm sure you've heard of. Um, the public diplomacy officers handle that. Um, so when you take the test, you do have to claim a, a career track. So you do have to choose one because the test is slightly different. And so the first process is an online test. Um, like I said, it's free. They offer them all over the country. Um, and it's computer-based now. When I took it, it was Scantron. Um, and, but you take a test. It's kind of random, the questions. I, I don't know how to, there's, there are study guides, but it's a lot about history and, and, uh, and knowing about the world. But uh, it's kind of just general knowledge. And then you'll also answer some questions based on your career track. If you pass the written test, you go on to the QEP, which is, and um, they ask you to write some essays about yourself, and you submit a resume. And this is new. When I joined the State Department, they didn't, or when I took the test, rather, um, they didn't ask any sort of background information. So this is new, and it, you should use it to your advantage. This is your chance to say why you want to be a Foreign Service Officer and why you sh they should choose you. So if you you submit these essays and some personal information, and then you're invited to the oral exam. So the oral exam, um, you need, I th think you need to come to Washington still at this point. Um, and it's a full day exam. Um, it includes a group exercise. It includes a written portion where you're given like a case study and you have to go through this big binder of emails and figure out what the problem is. And it includes a um, structured interview where there are certain precepts for foreign service officers. And so they ask you things like, T 
tell me about a time when you displayed that you have um, cultural sensitivities in regards to socioeconomic status or something like that. And it, they structure you through the interview. And then there's hypothetical situations where they make up countries. Like they actually give you like maps and all of these crazy things about fictional countries. And they hand it to you and they say, there was an earthquake in the country of X. What do you do? <laughs> and you basically go through the different steps of what you would do. Um, so there's a lot of information about this online, um, but the test is the most traditional way to go to enter the State Department, but or to enter the Foreign Service specifically. But there are also a lot of internships, and that's kind of the best way to determine if that's something that interests you. So also, if you go to careers.state.gov. Um, it talks about student opportunities. Um, so I encourage you, if you're the least bit interested, to apply for an internship. Um, you can apply for an internship overseas and work in a post overseas. And they give you substantive work, um, especially if you apply to a small post. So that's just a word to the wise. Um, or you can work in Washington and see what that is like. Um, I think I've talked a lot. <laughs> I could, what, tell us about uh, what it the steps would be to get involved with the UN? Um, so the best way to get a job at the UN, that's kind of a hard question to answer because the hiring process at the UN is very complicated and bureaucratic. Um, I would say that the most formal way of getting a job is to take the Young Professionals Program exam. Um, but the thing is that one requires a master's degree and it also, um, I guess there's a lot of different requirements. Um, one of them is that, well, you have a master's degree. You also can't be over the age of 32, but I'm sure you guys won't really have a problem with that. Um, and uh, you need like two years of work experience. Um, yeah, there's like a website, um, it's called Inspira, and you can uh, look up all the requirements. Um, so they have a general paper for the exam um, they test you uh, a very general knowledge about the UN, um, and and then if you pass that part, they'll actually look at your uh, specialized paper exams. Um, and that one, you actually have to pick a topic in your field, and the field that you pick has to be related to your um, undergraduate study. So for example, um, I did studied political science, so I would be taking political affairs. Um, someone who studied law would be taking the legal affairs. Um, there's also like architecture and accounting. Um, but the subjects vary, vary each year, and it's also not offered every year. Um, and it also depends on your citizenship. So one year, um, maybe there will be a, a slot for US citizens. Um, the next year, there may not be. Um, and also, like for example, the political affairs exam was given this year, but uh, the last time it was given w was like four years ago. So you don't really know when it'll be given. So you kind of have to keep on checking the website, unfortunately. Um, and after you pass the exam, uh, you would be invited for an interview. Um, so uh, about like last year, um, more than 40,000 people applied from around the world. Only uh, like 100 get selected. So. It's, but don't be discouraged. Yeah. <laughs> um, another way of getting a job at the UN is to do the junior professional program. And that one, you would actually go through your government. Um, and then they'll place you for two years in an agency or a department within the UN. Um, but just because you got the JPO, it doesn't really mean that you'll actually get a permanent position at the UN. So. And I think they have a requirement where after you work there for two years, um, you can't apply for a job in the UN for six months or something. Um, so I took the non-traditional way. Um, so I started out as an intern um, and then got a full-time position. I think that's, that would be the best way, I would think, because I didn't really have to, well, I just had to be enrolled in a master's program to do the internship and things like that. Um, but it's also not that easy because I guess not all organizations in the UN would have, you know, like positions that are available when you need it. Um, I think it's also about who you know in the UN. So it's really important to network with people in the UN because then if they have an opening in their department and you tell them that, you know, you're interested in working at the UN, they might offer you an interview and that could 
you know, you'll be able to sidestep a lot of the processes. Anna, what do you think? Um, I'm a really big proponent of internships. Um, and actually, I highly recommend the State Department internship that Vanessa was talking about. It's a really easy online application. And it's a really good way to, one, live abroad for a while, two, um, get the feel for what the foreign service is like, because the, the exam process for the FSO isn't that easy, as you heard from her. So it's a really good introduction to it. Um, otherwise, for NGOs and nonprofits, depending on the size of the organization, an internship is the best way um, to get into that organization. Uh, specifically for the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, uh, it's not that big of an organization. There's about 50 staff members. So entry-level positions um, don't come up that often, and when they do, they tend to be filled internally by our interns. So we have internships uh, every six months. We just started one um, the semester from January to June, so the next one will be open in June, and that'll go through um, December or, or whatever it is. I think it's a really great way to get familiar with the sort of the culture and the demeanor of the organization. You figure out how, if it's something that you want to do, or if it's not, you figure out that it's just one more thing to cross off that, that, that you don't want to do it. Um, unfortunately, a lot of them tend to be unpaid. So I know that it may be you know, a burden for a lot of people. But I highly, highly recommend doing an internship. Otherwise, you can always just apply for whatever um, positions are open on the website. Um, but an internship is the best way in. I echo exactly what Anna said, which is, uh, you know, I, I could talk about AJC a little bit, but that's a, that's a very narrow, you know, organization, and we're not the biggest organization in the world. But um, one of the best things to do if you are interested in foreign policy and international NGO work is get out to Washington. Um, Washington's a terrific city. It's a fun place to live. Uh, it's very expensive, but you know everyone lives like six people in an apartment, and it's 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 a lot of fun. Um, and you know it's it's replete with foreign policy NGOs, uh, a million think tanks, a million advocacy organization uh, organizations, organizations, a million um, PACs. I mean everything's there. You can find whatever you want for people doing a variety a variety of work um, at home and overseas. So it, it, it's almost limit, uh, un, limitless. We personally hire a lot of interns, especially during the summer. Um, you know, it's, it's not fair, but we don't pay them. But um, it, this is sort of the case for a lot of interns in Washington, is it's initially unpaid. Uh, but what Anna said is, when we do have entry-level positions that come up, and we do have actually two uh, that are going to be posted pretty soon, we immediately turn to our intern pool. To figure out, you know, because if we if we have someone in hand who's been great, you know, why would we go out there uh, to look? So I, I really think getting that internship is a really big deal. Uh, who are the interns? We, we people we really look for. Um, anyone who's ever worked on a political campaign, that's really a good thing. You know, a la David Axelrod. Um, anyone who has um, worked on the Hill, you know, has been a, a, a staffer on the Hill, is also a really good thing. You know, getting involved as early as you can in a political campaign, latching yourself to a successful candidate it is never a bad thing. Um, we're looking for people often who have some specialties. Uh, we, we, we personally have an Asia Pacific Institute and a Latino and Latin American Affairs Institute housed within our DC office. If we find people who have, my gosh, who can speak Mandarin, who can uh, speak Spanish well enough to translate, uh, these are all good things and help, you know, getting an internship. So if you have a specialty as well, don't don't ever be afraid to highlight it. But uh, so my advice really is, um, you know, if you've thought about ever passing, just going out to Washington, I think I think it's a really a really good idea. And yeah, make sure to do your research because there are so many NGOs out there, especially in D.C. And some do have paid internships, like the National Democratic Institute, um, and they're a really really big NGO. And they have a lot of internship positions, and they do pay. I mean, it's not much, but at least it's not unpaid. And it's a really good organization. And there's so many others, like CSIS or mm -hmm. Brookings or the Wilson Institute. I mean, there's just dozens and exactly. dozens. Exactly. Uh, Brookings, Heritage, everyone, all the think tanks. Uh, one, one, of the, one of the fun things is that in the summer especially, I mean, the average age in Washington, D.C. becomes about 25. Uh, I mean, it just gets less very, than <laughs> it, less than that, it, it, very, very young in the summer. I mean, there's interns throughout the whole year, but the city just like radically changes um, in the summer. Um, so 
one more question that I'm going to ask these guys, and then we'll really open it up to you. And of course, this is the, the ubiquitous last question. Um, if you only knew then what you know now, um, what, what are the top two pieces of advice you'd, you'd give to these, the assembled about uh, getting into the field? That, what, what did you do wrong that you might do differently? And we'll start this way. <laughs> That's pretty difficult. Um, I wish, when I was an undergrad, I wish that I'd done what you guys are, exactly what you're doing now, is done a lot more like career advancement or career planning or career advising or whatever it's called. I wish that I did a lot, that I went to the office that handled that and talked to them, because I, I, I didn't do that as much. Like I didn't um, formally sort of research all my opportunities. And another thing I didn't do as much is, is network, really. I mean, I did a fair amount, but I always kind of thought I hated networking, which I find out now I don't. But um, it, it was, it's really important. I mean, it's so important to make connections because, um, like someone up here mentioned, you know, I think you mentioned, Iko, that once you get to know people, I mean, you can save yourself a lot of steps um, if you make a good impression, that is. <laughs> um, second piece of advice, just do a lot of research. Do a lot of research and try anything. Say yes to anything, even though um, you may not think it's exactly what you want to do, because if you're anything like me, you have no idea. So just be open to anything. Um, I would also uh, echo Anna's advice um, on networking, um, especially if you want to work for the UN. Uh, it's really important that you know a lot of people in the organization. I think it'll make it easier in terms of finding a job there. And also um, take a lot of challenging courses. I mean, I know most classes here are challenging, <laughs> but um, yeah, take uh, a lot of classes that would allow you to develop like research skills, writing, um, analytical skills. Um, I guess uh, one thing, one word of advice regarding the foreign service exam process is that it is a long process. And again, I was lucky to kind of circumvent that because of the fellowship. I still had to take the test, but at least I, I, I knew what the end result was. So if, if that's something you decide you want to do, or, or not even, it, if it interests you at all, just take the test. Just try. Because chances are you're going to have to do something else while you're waiting for the results of the test and the results of your security clearance, because it can take about a year from the time you take that first test to the time that they call you in. But so if there's the slightest bit of you that's interested, go for it. Um, because it's something that if it all comes together, it's a great opportunity that you don't have to take, but you at least have as an option. Um, so that would be one, one word of advice is just kind of go for it. Um, I guess the second one, um, because of my fellowship, again, it was an amazing, amazing opportunity, but because of it, I was restricted in terms of my, my timing. I had to go straight from undergraduate to grad school. Um, and while that might be the right choice for everyone, I do sort of wish I had some working time in between. And purely because I was tired, <laughs> and I was tired of, of academia, because the University of Chicago is a really challenging place. So when I got to graduate school, there were a lot of really amazing opportunities that I didn't take advantage of purely because I didn't appreciate them, because I was so anxious to get out into the working world. So I think everybody, it, you know, it might some people might want to go straight through, and so I'm not trying to convince you one way or the other, but to consider that school is an amazing, amazing opportunity and place to be. And I hope that you appreciate that, whatever that means, because there are great opportunities just to be around people, just to talk to interesting, smart people around you, and to attend events that might be going around. And try to, even when you're tired and don't want to do that, try to still get out of bed and go. Um, I did want to say, only because I'm thinking of it now, I brought a lot of handouts. So afterwards, um, come and get some handouts from me because I don't want to have to take them home. And, um, and I also will give you my card. So if you end up in DC, as everyone keeps saying, uh, over the summer or whenever, please feel free to contact me. I'm saying that now just because I don't want to forget to say that later. <laughs> so the main thing I'd advise um, that, I would, well, that I would have done differently is actually something a little bit out of my control, which is I just didn't know coming out of college. What, I had no idea what I wanted to do. I mean, none. And I don't know if there's anyone in here, maybe you know, that, that was something more unique to UC Santa Cruz than to, 
to use Chicago. But uh, I mean, I, f I finished college and just, I, I don't know. So, I, and, and I wasn't really in that mode. So, you know, I, I took a job. I mean, I, I, w I worked in a law firm for a little bit just and just kind of did some legal research. And, you know, it only, you know, I only did it for a little while till I headed overseas. But it, it just, I think there's a lot of people who aren't really quite sure at this age. And I just, I, I just, my advice, I guess, would be don't worry about it. I mean, don't worry about it. Seize opportunities that they come. Um, I think you're going to learn as much from things you don't like as things that you do like. And I, I eliminated a number of different career paths simply because I tried it out and I hated it. Um, and that, that's okay. So in that spirit, I, and, and taking my moderator's prerogative, I'd like to just kind of offer four quick pieces of advice. Um, one is utilize your alumni network. It, it's really important. And I, I didn't do that when I was an undergrad, but I did it actually when I was before I came to work for AJC, I, I, it wasn't U of C's um, alumni network, it was actually Kellogg's. But the point of the story, it holds true uh, across schools, is that I would seek, if I had an interest in an organization, I literally would go look at their board, then go on the, uh, the alumni website, find out who works there, and, and I'd email them. And to a person, every single person I asked for an informational interview gave me one, and graciously. And I think you'll find that people are really, really excited to do that and happy to do it. So just don't ever be shy about contacting someone um, that's in your alumni network. They like the school. They want to do it. Second thing, seek mentors and connections. Um, don't, don't be shy about meeting people and, and keeping their phone number or keeping their, you know, their cell. It, it, it's good. And contact them. And don't, it may seem awkward to approach people you don't know, but... It isn't. Uh, networking's not a bad thing. Uh, no one should be ashamed of it. Uh, people do it all the time. Um, third thing is do research on your connections. Know them. Uh, it, it's When you meet with them, it, you're bound to have no people in common. You're bound to have had a shared experience. I got a job once, uh, my first job at, at Freddie Mac ages ago when I was in affordable housing. Um, I think they hired me because like he and this guy I was interviewing with, we both played rugby against each other in the same school. <laughs> So, you know, you know he, he was at, at Cal Berkeley, I was at Santa Cruz, we used to play each other. So, you, you just never know um, where you're going to find a connection. And the last the thing is uh, really echoing what, what, um, what um, David Axelrod said, and this is particularly true of careers in NGOs and foreign policy work and nonprofit work globally or domestically, is, you know, you really have to have a heart for it. I mean, you, it's really going to... You don't want to have to muddle through a career. Feel a passion for it. I mean, especially true in the nonprofit world, that service passion, that passion to do good by the world, to change things. Uh, figure out where your passion is and just follow it. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's so, so rewarding when you're doing what you love to do every single day when you wake up. And, uh, you know, I wasn't feeling that, um, structuring mortgage-backed securities. But, um, but I'm feeling it now, you know, doing the global advocacy work we do. And so don't, don't be shy about sticking with your, your passion. So with that, that's, that's, we, we've got a good half hour till we break. And I wanted to leave that time, since now you, now you know all of us really well, to feel free to ask questions of your own to the multitude of us or to one of us. Just uh, raise your hand and we'll, we'll get going. Hi, um, my name is Marina Fang. I'm a second year public policy major. And my question is for just anyone who wants to answer. Um, how do you sort of balance between sort of preparing yourself for something specific, but also keeping all those doors open? Because I know some of you came out of college and didn't really have an idea of what you wanted to do, while others, others sort of had a clear intention and then just sort of went with it. So how do you kind of balance the two? So actually, I was terribly upset because David Axelrod totally stole my piece of advice I was going to have. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> one thing, I had a professor once that told me that statistically, this generation will have seven different careers in your lifetime. And that's not seven different jobs. That's seven different careers. And that's vastly different than you know a few generations ago where you sat in the same desk for your entire career. So one piece of advice that I've received, um, and although I'm 
can't really tell you if it works yet. I'll check back in a few years. But if David Axelrod says it works, then, then it does. It's to keep, um, keep your eye on one step at a time. <clears throat> you don't have to find a job that will be the end-all, be-all career of your life. Like, you just don't. That's not the way the world is working now, especially in these types of careers and in, this, in these fields. People like to see a diversity of experiences. They, nobody moves from point A to point B to Z anymore. Everybody goes, you know, backwards. Like, look, look at leaders that um, have jobs that you think sound really amazing and you would aspire to, and look at their biographies, and they've, you know, worked in all different sectors. So, at least for me, I'm telling myself that I want to continue doing whatever is my passion at that time. I'm trying not to overthink it in terms of what will be my passion 30 years from now. It's, I'm looking for something that will, that will inspire me, um, that will give me new skills, um, that will pique my curiosity in the moment right now, and, and also fit with my personal life right here, right now. Um, and I hope that I'll be able to kind of switch as my priorities change and as um, my, my skills change. But like I said, maybe you have to check back with me in a few years and see if that works out. Maybe, as I said a bit earlier, to say yes to everything that comes yeah. along. Um, I think it's really important to be really flexible and really open while doing your research. I mean, I think a lot of you have an inkling of what you like. And so as things come along, I say just take the opportunities. I mean, have confidence in yourself that it'll end up well enough and you'll end up where you're meant to go as long as you're like actively trying, you know, like you're doing, you're doing everything you can along the way. You're not just like sitting back and waiting for a job you think is the right job to come to you. Just be open and take any opportunities you can basically. Um, sort of adding to um, the two previous speakers, um, I think you never really know um, what your interests would lead to. And I mean, even if you acquire certain skills that you might think is, is not that important right now, um, it may come in handy later in life. Um, and like, for example, um, I never thought I would be interested in law until uh, last year when I had the opportunity to go to the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea which is the UN um, court that deals with maritime law based in Hamburg, Germany. And so sometimes it just, you know, you just never know, so. I think there's the balancing the sort of the general with the very specific. We, the, the NGO sector, I think we are, and I think the NGO sector writ large is going through a lot of changes right now. Very real changes are our donors, if we're a donor supported organization, are asking very different questions of us than they were 10 years ago. They're asking, for us to prove our efficacy. They're asking us to prove it numerically. They want analytics that they never requested before. Um, there's some tax changes going on at the federal level that may affect the tax treatment of donations to nonprofits, which may end up making it, there being less incentive for people to give to nonprofits. Um, we're having to prove ourselves over and over again that we're, we're a viable business. And for all the people who work for us, it's not enough to be a really, really cool specialist in you know, the history and foreign policy of Brazil or whatever. You have to do that, and you also have to have a little bit of a development professional in you. You have to think as a business person a little bit. You have to think about what you're doing and how that, how that really translates uh, to helping the organization move forward. And, and I say that in the spirit of um, think of, think of yourselves as, as well-rounded people. Think of yourself at the same time as experts on a specific area but also people who are capable of thinking in, in, in business-like terms, and, and that's really going to help you. Um, hi, my name is Josh. I'm a third year <coughs> excuse me, political science major with um, an interest in international relations. Um, I was wondering, um, just because everyone brought up internships multiple times, but there are those times when you can't find something paid. How do you reconcile that need for a paying job and um, to actually get in on the internship scene, especially in places like DC where you, I mean, for example, myself, I don't have family to live with there, so I would definitely have to have a job. Thank you. I actually had an internship in DC that was not paid. And what I did is I worked as a waitress in Buca de Beppo <laughs> on Connecticut. <laughs> 
And it was horrible, but <laughs> I, I mean, it was absolutely terrible. I think waitressing is the worst thing you can possibly do. But, um, and retail, I did both. Um, but it, I mean, it worked, it, it paid my rent, and I found some you know, roommates to live with, some people I knew that were also doing the same thing. And my roommates also did this, they waitressed at other restaurants. Um, and so I was, you know, I, I was really busy between do, having an internship and, and waitressing, but it was worth it. it. It was really incredibly worth it, actually. Um, two things. One is that um, it's a nature of uh, many internships, but not all of them, to be unpaid. Um, that is, that's, of course, why our unpaid interns don't stay a long time, because you, you literally can't afford to. Um, I have found, though, from time to time, if an intern is, is really good, there's a way to figure out some sort of stipend arrangement. And while it, it may not be a quote-unquote paid internship, we could sort of arrange a stipend of it on, a, on a need basis. Um, and then, you know, the economies of it are, are that I wasn't kidding. I mean, I've got, we've got young staff who are, are living six to an apartment in DuPont Circle. And it's just, it's, you just crowd in for a year. And, uh, you know, it's, um, it's just what, okay. Just, just one, of, one of the things we have to do. There's also money at the University of Chicago for students <laughs> who have unpaid internships. Um, the Summer Action Grant and the International Experience Grant, I was going to mention at the end, but it just seemed to fit in now, so I'm sorry to interrupt. Oh, um, the deadline for these is April 1st, and people are talking about taking advantage of opportunities, and this is one opportunity that you should seize as college students at the University of Chicago, because not every school offers this kind of funding. So this is an opportunity that if you find yourself in the position where you have an unpaid internship and you need money to support it, there is money out there. Sorry. Can I also add that also, in addition to the programs that exist, there are also funding that might not be out in the open. I had an internship in, in Germany with the State Department, and it was unpaid. And so I reached out to the German department, and I wrote a little proposal. I think I had, like, pie charts and stuff like that. And I wrote to the... Um, uh, I developed a relationship with the head of the German department, and they gave me a grant um, to fund an unpaid internship. So even if it's not a traditional source, you can just don't, don't be ashamed to ask for money. Hi, I'm William Wilcox. I'm a third year international studies major. And I was wondering, when you choose to exact change in the world, how do you choose between working at NGOs versus going into government, and why? That's a good question. Um, okay, so I, I I thought I wanted to work for the government, um, and I m still may want to, so I applied for the State Department internship, and it was a really, really, really great internship. Um, however, it still requires you to take the exam and everything, get in for it, so so I did the exam, I went through the whole thing, and it just, it didn't, I got to the last stage and I didn't pass, um, so, but I encourage all of you to try it, even if you don't pass, I think it's a really good um, practice. To, you know, to, to figure out, I guess, the behavior, like kind of what's expected. And it's, I think it just, you know, is an advantage for you. It, it builds up your skill set. Um, I didn't decide to work between one or the other, really. I don't, maybe some people do. I just kind of applied to see, you know, what could happen. And the first thing that came up was nonprofit. So I think I will eventually move into working for the government. But I don't know if it's necessarily a choice between one or the other. Uh, and uh, again, the organization I work for, um, it, it is nonprofit. It is an NGO, but it's not advocacy at all. And I think there is a little bit of a difference between maybe working for the government and working for advocacy NGOs. Um, but for the one I work for, that's not necessarily the case. Um, I, I, I at one time in my life worked for a Fortune 50 company for a long time. So I had experience working for just a gigantic organization and literally being a very small cog in the wheel of making this organization run. Uh, I've also worked for the state of Illinois at one time doing affordable housing. So I've sort of had a gov you know, state government experience, a Fortune 50 experience. And one of the things, one of the calculus, I, the calculus I did when I went, before I went to AJC was really about not just what they did, but what the organization was like and what, what kind of environment I was going to be happy in and thrive in. And I think you could do that same calculus and say, you know, just do, do I want to be one, do I want to be in an organization of over 50,000 people or do I want to be in an organization of five people? It's a very different thing. Um, I'm happy personally in the sort of 250 person range, lots of rooms for promotion, movement, growth, 
but we don't have to worry about payroll every week. Um, so it, it was kind of a, it was a perfect fit. I, I think, you know, and part of this is you may just have to try out different sort of things. Try working for the government, try working for um, uh, a non-governmental NGO and, you know, see what resonates with you. You'll, you'll sort of feel it in your gut which one you're happier in and which one you're going to thrive in. Yeah. Um, working for the government definitely has its challenges. Um, I don't make policy. I carry it out. And it doesn't matter if I agree with it or not. Um, I'm not able to. There, there are ways that you can um, express your uh, your views to the to the State Department. But as a representative of the United States government overseas, I can't you know, go on camera and say that I hate this policy or that. Um, so it really is something that you, if, if you want to work for the government um, and you, if you will be in a position where you aren't able to necessarily have a, a large amount of impact, um, you have to be able to see if that's all right with you. Um, for me, I, I guess I have that deep amount of patriotism inside of me that I, be I believe in, in, in America in a larger sense. And that's helped me cope with any time that I haven't been 100% satisfied with, uh, with the policy that I'm carrying out. Um, but, but yeah, it is something that I feel like probably if, if that's something that you weren't able to do, maybe working for the government wouldn't be a good idea. And there are also people who work for the government sometimes, and then certain events in history have transpired, and they decided they no longer wanted to work for the government anymore. So that's um, something to, and I guess actually, sorry, one more thing. Um, also working in Vietnam as someone in the American government was interesting. Obviously, we have a very complicated history with Vietnam. And while um, the average person will be very nice to Americans. The government hates our government. Um, I mean, I should don't write that down. Uh, <laughs> but, but you know, the, for rightfully so, it's a complicated relationship, and so that was that was hard. Um, again, don't write that down. <laughs> Questions? Uh, hi, I'm Mariana. I'm a second year, a economics major, and all of you kind of work in an international setting to you know um, a certain degree. And I was just kind of wondering how you personally keep up to date with the international political culture and climate. Thank you. Okay. Uh, my organization and my department, um, that's absolutely required to know what's going on. Uh, you have to have your generalist, basically, in my department. Because, you know, right now I have, I'm planning like six different programs in the next four months. And they range from like elections in Mongolia to drones in Yemen, to um, you know, education in Latin America. So you kind of have to really keep up to date on everything all the time, and it's as simple as reading the news. Um, I find that Twitter really helps if you follow the right, you know, like if you follow the news outlets and the right people and stuff. It's really helpful. Like it's, it aggregates the news and current events really well. Um, just so, just the nature of my job helps me stay on top of everything. Um, but I think it's great if you just read a lot, a lot of newspapers, a lot of outlets, um, you know, New York Times, BBC, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that's actually uh, exactly what I do for a job. Um, I monitor and analyze uh, all sorts of um, international events, um, specifically like natural disasters and wars. Um, my focus is on uh, piracy off the coast of Somalia, but because, um, so my office in New York works eight hours a day and then after we finish monitoring and analyzing um, these global events uh, each day, we would actually pass it down to the Japan office. And then after that, the Japan office would um, send their work to the Geneva office. So basically, um, each of the three offices uh, cover um, these international events for eight hours a day. And so it'll be a total of 24 hours. So that way, we were able to keep track of um, all the international events. For the DC world, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a given if you're in an international NGO that you know what's going on. And a lot of that's on your own time. Uh, you can't help but be exposed to it at work with the conversation and the, that goes on and the, 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 flow, the, you know, the flow of discussion. But you've got to be all over it. You've got to have you know, all the feeds that you need coming in. You have to at least scan the major newspapers at a minimum. 
uh, you have to know who all you know who the, who the important talking heads are and what they wrote most recently, and people talk about that stuff, and you need to know it. Um, I think you find though, uh, at least in Washington, that because all the people you're hanging out with all the time are also doing the same thing, it's what you talk about all the time, and everyone's like, which embassy party are you going to tonight? And that's like, and then it just sort of flows from there, and it becomes the social topic, and people, you know, are you going to the hill, this thing on the hill, or did you, did you hear the thing, did you go over to the thing at Brookings Institution? This is like normal, what people do stuff. So it's an incredible volume of information to stay on top of it all, um, but people do it, and I, I don't think it's onerous, I think, uh, it just becomes sort of part of your life and who you are, and then all of a sudden, you know, you're very wonky, and you know, you become sort of a public policy wonk. Um, I found I really like listening to podcasts, um, especially while, while commuting. Everybody's got their headphones in, so I've got my podcast that I listen to every morning and, and afternoon. Um, also, the art of productive procrastination. When you don't want to do something else, look at the news. <laughs> so it, it's. Uh, but I, yeah, I think there, it's just one of those things that try to keep, uh, try to keep interested and stay curious because sometimes it can feel intimidating, especially when you're in school to be like, oh my god, I have to read. Uh, I, I got, had um, I had the New York Times uh, a subscription to the Daily New York Times in my third year of college. That was horrible because I just had newspapers like stacking up and I never. I, I never got to it. I was like months behind. So try not to let it get to that point. Just try to stay interested and then it won't feel like a burden. Sure. I'm going to give my political uh, leanings away. I really love Rachel Maddow. I'm a huge Rachel Maddow fan. So she's usually in the morning. Um, BBC. I love anything on NPR. Um, yeah. Uh, there's uh, news. You can just get like news bites. From uh, from a lot of different organizations, and like, you can listen to Dateline, the actual show, but you listen to it. More questions? I can just ask. Um, I was just curious, what was the role of foreign language in your careers and in your everyday life? That was my question. You want to start? Sure. We'll, we'll work our way across again. Um, so I, in my undergrad, I double majored in international studies and French. And I, stu you know, studied abroad in, in France and all of that. And um, I haven't officially or on a regular basis been using French. But actually, when we have, um, you know, the ambassador of France is coming soon to speak, or we partner with the Alliance Française in Chicago a lot, and it's it gives you another level of um, like cooperation and partnership, and it gives a really good relationship. Um, so I use it when I can. I haven't had to, you know, I can't say that it's actually. It's, as a person, it's helped me, um, when I say advance, <laughs> I think it's made me a better person. Like I, th I think your brain works a different way when you know more than one language. And I think it helps you um, think faster. It helps you make connections faster. And it gives you a lot more resources. Like I can read Le Monde, you know, and, and understand it. And I can see things from different perspectives. <laughs> I, think, I think you're a French student, okay. <laughs> um, so I think it's really important personally to know it. And again, you know, ICO works at the UN. You know that French and English are the two official languages. So if that's, if that's you know, your plan or if that's something you'd like, then of course it's really important. Um, but I'm just a big proponent of second, third, and you know, fourth, whatever languages. Um, I studied French for six years um, because I knew that I wanted to work at the UN. And French and English are the two working languages of the UN. But um, there's other official languages, which are Russian, Arabic, Spanish, and uh, Chinese. So um, I don't really speak any of those languages, but because um, my first language is uh, Japanese, and that doesn't really come in useful at the UN. But during my first and second uh, years of grad school, um, I interned at the Permanent Mission of Japan to the UN, which is uh, part of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Japanese government. And um, it came in useful then. I'm gonna let you finish up. Let's go in right now. Okay, sure. Um, so I, uh, as I said, I studied in Spain in high school, and then I studied German in, in university and studied in Germany. Um, but I guess that probably helped my Pickering application. When you're um, applying for the Foreign Service, I didn't go into all of the logistics, but after you pass the oral exam, 
you're not 100% there yet. Um, you're then put on a roster um, in order of your score. And uh, you then have to go through your security clearance and everything. But then they take however many people on the roster that they have jobs available. So you could still pass the entire thing, but if you don't have a high enough score, you might not be pulled off the roster, and you're only on the roster for a year, and then you have to start over again. Um, but one of the things you can do to boost your score is to have a foreign language, and you can take, a, it's a telephone test. Um, and so you, you take this test, and then if you have a certain proficiency in a language, that boosts your score to a certain degree. Um, Language learning is really important, obviously, for the State Department. Um, we have a, a full language school. Um, before I went to Vietnam, I spent uh, over six months learning Vietnamese all day, every day. That was my job, um, which is, was really cool. It was really hard on the brain, but, um, but really, really fun. And, but they don't necessarily look against you if you don't have a language proficiency. There are plenty of people who are in the State Department um, you know, joining the career in their 40s or 50s and then learning a language for the first time. So it's, it's not impossible, but it, it definitely helps. So my, my answer to that is we're, we're always, when we hire, and I think a lot of international NGOs uh, are looking for people with international experience. Does that definitely mean you speak a foreign language? No. But the, we're, we often like to see people who have spent some time overseas and not, not the vacation with your parents or whatever but you know, really on your own, either working or something academic for at least a quarter, preferably a semester or a year. But just like having been overseas, I, I'm not sure that it actually translates into directly anything useful in your day-to-day -day work, but it, it shows a, a sort of a level of interest in world affairs, of being overseas, of, of, of worldliness, uh, fairly or unfairly. On the very practical level, there are a lot of NGOs um, foreign policy NGOs that have offices overseas. I mean, ours is one of them. We have nine. And you know, if you want to work in our Paris office, you got to speak French. I mean, if you want to work in our Berlin office, you have to speak German. And uh, you know, French as well for our Brussels office. So there's that very practical level. And I think you'll find a lot of opportunities open for you if you have that proficiency. Uh, surely not required, but um, it's, it's looked very well upon. Hi, um, my name is Frederick. I'm a second year studying economics and environmental studies. Um, I just have a question with regards to the profession that you have. Um, I know that travel is one of the biggest comp components of it. You're moving around a lot. And so how do you sort of juggle that or balance that with your personal life, your friends, your family, things like that? Oh, OK. I'll go, and then I'll go. Um, well, my situation's a little unique and weird, again, because I live in Chicago, but work in, in Washington and New York. So it's like that every other week I'm moving back and forth. But if that's not what I think you mean. I mean, I, I do go out annually at least to our Jerusalem office, to our Berlin office, and our Brussels office. Paris is a smaller office and requires less maintenance. Um, and you know, we have sort of smaller consultancy shops in some of the other cities I listed. I gotta say it's not a problem balancing anything because it doesn't happen that that often. I mean, it's not like a foreign service career, which is a really th something about balancing, you know, family and and, and travel. But um, I still love it. You know, I, I gotta say it's like the people who say, you know, I travel overseas so much, I'm getting tired of it. I'm not tired of it. It's so much fun. Um, no, I mean it's really terrific. I, I you know, my biggest regret is I can't, you know, more often than not, I can't take my family. Because it's just, I'm in doing business all day. But it's, it's exciting. It's exciting every time. You know, go, I'm going to be uh, in two weeks in Berlin. And it's no less exciting going to Berlin this fourth time than it was the first time. Um, so I really like it. Um, and you develop friends in those locations, and then you see them every time you're there. So it hasn't been a, it hasn't been a big problem balancing it, because it's not like it's an overwhelming thing. Uh, the commuting part to Washington, New York, kind of more of a pain. But that's a choice we made, you know, personal choice, just like, you know, balancing all travel and work and family. Um, well, my job actually doesn't really require traveling. Um, I sit in front of a computer pretty much all day. Um, <laughs> I can even work from home if I wanted to. 
Um, but last year, uh, I actually went to Germany because there was a position opening. Um, and uh, since my expertise is, well, not really expertise, but my specialization is in um, piracy, um, I actually chose to go there for a few months. And I guess I wanted to go because, um, I mean, I'm still not married. I don't have kids or anything. So I thought it would be a good opportunity to you know, work abroad and gain some experiences there. And final. <laughs> okay. Um, two minutes. So, okay. Oh, two minutes. Okay. So I will say very quickly that um, first, for me, going overseas um, we, as part of the State Department was a different experience for me because I had been overseas before as a student, as a, and also as an intern, and um, wearing the U.S. government hat was a different challenge that I hadn't fully seen before. It's, it's a little bit harder to get into the actual local culture, especially when there's socioeconomic differences. Um, so I will not lie, it was surprisingly hard for me um, this past time to live uh, in Vietnam for two years. I had a great time, but there were challenges that I didn't foresee. I thought I was a pro at this. So um, a few things. One, I, I will say, um, so I'm, I'm single. At, at the moment I went to Vietnam, I adopted a dog from Vietnam, a little chihuahua named Gilda, and she's awesome. Um, but I do think, I see the people around me, I think the happiest foreign service officers are those who kind of had their established family units already and were able to locate their entire support system with them. I, I think that they seem to have a really good system. I mean, they pay for your kids to go to private schools and they have all sorts of benefits. So I think those people seem to have be the happiest. Um, I, I will say uh, completely uh, candidly that single men seem to have a better time. Um, it's just the way the world works. Um, single women, <laughs> it, it, it was hard for a lot of my friends. Um, and I happened to be in a long distance relationship. So that, um, and we ended up, it ended up being fine. Um, we're still together, he, and we're still doing long distance. He's in New York. Um, <laughs> but, that, but that is a challenge. So it, it, was, it is something to consider. Again, it seems to work best when you can have your support system that you can just transfer with you. Um, but sometimes jobs are you know, fulfilling enough that maybe that's great. So I'd say follow kind of what what seems to make the most sense, but don't forget your personal life. It's really, really important to feel like you have a support system around you. Yeah, the last word on that is exactly what you just said. I, I've done a lot of traveling for this job, as a, working for an NGO, and a lot of traveling from my previous career working for a capital markets company. This work is so fulfilling that it's just not a burden. Whereas it, you know, traveling around and visiting you know, bank clients all the time, it just didn't seem like it was really uh, fulfilling in the same way. Um, I think that's 445. So <laughs> thank you for coming. Come get yeah, I want to, whoa, wait, sorry. <laughs> Um, I want to thank, um, on the behalf of um, Career Advancement and the College Programming Office and everyone else at the university who um, worked on this massive event, I want to thank you guys for sitting here and networking and doing exactly what you're meant to be doing, which is taking the next step. But I most of all want to thank our fantastic panelists. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you, like, like I said in uh, my comments earlier, when I interrupted our panel and they were so gracious enough to let me do it. We at Career Advancement are eager to help you take the next step after the next step and um, make your dreams whatever they are, your passion. Um, if it's international NGOs, I'm the person you want to talk to. We have free money. I won't waste any more of your time. We also have a website, so you can check that out. But I want to thank you all very much for coming and uh, feel free, if our panelists are able to stay, they may be able to pass out cards and answer a few questions. Otherwise, enjoy your time in the city and have a wonderful Saturday. Yay. Thank you guys so much.